Book One, Chapter Seven of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book One, A Just Man. Chapter Seven, Cravat. It is here that a fact falls naturally into place, which we must not omit, because it is one of the sort which show us best what sort of a man the Bishop of Digne was. After the destruction of the band of Gaspard Besse, who had infested the gorges of Olioul, one of his lieutenants, Cravat, took refuge in the mountains. He concealed himself for some time with his bandits, the remnant of Gaspard Besse's troop, in the country of Nice. Then he made his way to Piedmont, and suddenly reappeared in France, in the vicinity of Barcelonette. He was first seen at Josier, then at Tuile. He hid himself in the caverns of the Jouques de l'Aigle, and thence he descended towards the hamlets and villages through the ravines of Ubay and Ubayette. He even pushed as far as Ambrun, entered the cathedral one night, and despoiled the sacristy. His highway robberies laid waste the countryside. The gendarmes were set on his track, but in vain. He always escaped, sometimes he resisted by main force. He was a bold wretch. In the midst of all this terror the bishop arrived. He was making his circuit to Chastelar. The mayor came to him and urged him to retrace his steps. Pravat was in possession of the mountains as far as Arche and beyond. There was danger even with an escort. It merely exposed three or four unfortunate gendarmes to no purpose. Therefore, said the bishop, I intend to go without escort. You do not really mean that, monseigneur, exclaimed the mayor. I do mean it so thoroughly that I absolutely refuse any gendarme, and shall set out in an hour. Set out? Set out. Alone? Alone. Monseigneur, you will not do that. There exists yonder in the mountains, said the bishop, a tiny community no bigger than that, which I have not seen for three years. They are my good friends, those gentle and honest shepherds. They own one goat out of every thirty that they tend. They make very pretty woolen cords of various colors, and they play the mountain airs on little flutes with six holes. They need to be told of the good God now and then. What would they say to a bishop who was afraid? What would they say if I did not go? But the brigand, monseigneur! Hold, said the bishop, I must think of that. You are right. I may meet them. They, too, need to be told of the good God. But, Monseigneur, there is a band of them, a flock of wolves. Monsieur le maire, it may be that it is of this very flock of wolves that Jesus has constituted me the shepherd. Who knows the ways of providence? They will rob you, Monseigneur. I have nothing. They will kill you. An old goodman of a priest who passes along mumbling his prayers? Bah! To what purpose? Oh, mon Dieu, what if you should meet them? I should beg alms of them for my poor. Do not go, Monseigneur. In the name of heaven you are risking your life. Monsieur le maire, said the bishop, is that really all? I am not in the world to guard my own life, but to guard souls. They had to allow him to do as he pleased. He set out, accompanied only by a child who offered to serve as a guide. His obstinacy was bruited about the countryside, and caused great consternation. He would take neither his sister nor Madame Magloire. He traversed the mountain on muleback, encountered no one, and arrived safe and sound at the residence of his good friends, the shepherds. He remained there for a fortnight, preaching, administering the sacrament, teaching, exhorting. When the time of his departure approached, he resolved to chant a Te Deum pontifically. He mentioned it to the cure. But what was to be done? There were no episcopal ornaments. They could only place at his disposal a wretched village sacristy with a few ancient chasubles of threadbare damask adorned with imitation lace. Bah, said the bishop, let us announce our te deum from the pulpit, nevertheless, monsieur le cure. Things will arrange themselves. They instituted a search in the churches of the neighborhood. All the magnificence of these humble parishes combined would not have sufficed to clothe the chorister of a cathedral properly. While they were thus embarrassed, a large chest was brought and deposited in the presbytery for the bishop, by two unknown horsemen, who departed on the instant. 
The chest was opened. It contained a cope of cloth of gold, a mitre ornamented with diamonds, an archbishop's cross, a magnificent crozier, all the pontifical vestments which had been stolen a month previously from the treasury of Notre-Dame d'Ambrun. In the chest was a paper, on which these words were written, From Cravatte to Monseigneur Bienvenu. Did not I say that things would come right of themselves? said the bishop. Then he added with a smile, To him who contents himself with the surplus of a curate, God sends the cope of an archbishop. Monseigneur, murmured the cure, throwing back his head with a smile, God, or the devil. The bishop looked steadily at the cure, and repeated with authority, God. When he returned to Chastelard, the people came out to stare at him as at a curiosity, all along the road. At the priest's house in Chastelard, he rejoined Mademoiselle Baptistine and Madame Magloire, who were waiting for him, and he said to his sister, Well, was I in the right? The poor priest went to his poor mountaineers with empty hands, and he returns from them with his hands full. I set out bearing only my faith in God. I have brought back the treasure of a cathedral. That evening, before he went to bed, he said again, Let us never fear robbers nor murderers. Those are dangers from without, petty dangers. Let us fear ourselves. Prejudices are the real robbers, vices are the real murderers. The great dangers lie within ourselves. What matters it what threatens our head or our purse? Let us think only of that which threatens our soul. Then, turning to his sister, Sister, never a precaution on the part of the priest against his fellow man. That which his fellow does, God permits. Let us confine ourselves to prayer, when we think that a danger is approaching us. Let us pray not for ourselves, but that our brother may not fall into sin on our account. However, such incidents were rare in his life. We relate those of which we know, but generally he passed his life in doing the same things at the same moment. One month of his year resembled one hour of his day. As to what became of the treasure of the cathedral of Ambrun, we should be embarrassed by any inquiry in that direction. It consisted of very handsome things, very tempting things, and things which were very well adapted to be stolen for the benefit of the unfortunate. Stolen they had already been elsewhere. Half of the adventure was completed, it only remained to impart a new direction to the theft, and to cause it to take a short trip in the direction of the poor. However, we make no assertions on this point. Only a rather obscure note was found among the bishop's papers, which may bear some relation to this matter, and which is couched in these terms. The question is to decide whether this should be turned over to the cathedral or to the hospital. End of Book 1, Chapter 7 Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on November thirtieth, two 2007